In the interest of predictability, something I'm interested in is um, it's not okay. Now it's up. so. Something I'm interested in is the mortality of trees. In the last century, in the fourth IPCC, we all did couple carbon climate models. And the Hadley Center model of the last century uh, with Peter Cox crashed the, crashed the rainforest because of the drought. And that released a lot of carbon and led to a huge climate, car carbon climate feedback. But when you look at something like this, where you have a tree ring that shows you mega droughts, you know, according to Peter Cox, thought there should be no such trees, they should be dead, and the carbon should be in the atmosphere. So I'm asking the question, how do trees survive, and how can we predict, and how can we predict the survival or the demise of trees? I'll start with uh, Schokla and Mintz. Uh, Paul already referred to this paper. It's an impressive paper, not just because it's one of the early papers on evapotranspiration on, in the climate model, but the first reference of this paper is to Christopher, is to Christopher Columbus by his son Ferdinand, <laughs> reference number one, uh, where at the end, at the bottom it says since the, in the Azores, since the removal of forests that once covered those islands, they do not have so much moist mist and rain as before. So I'm really <laughs> sure, I don't know how you came, came up with Christopher Columbus. I, I, I understand, but how, how you found it, I'm very impressed. Um, so obviously evapotranspiration depends on subsurface moisture. And we go back to the last century, the fourth IPCC, here on the, on the upper left, you see precipitation and all the dots. This is the, what is plotted is the multi-model mean. And the dots mean that 80% of the models agree in the sign of the change. So this is uh, 2100 minus the, the present day. If you look at precipitation, you see, the, you see the Hadley cell increasing, the expansion of the Hadley cell. Here's the drying. Evaporation is easy. When it's warmer, my laundry dries faster, and so there's more evaporation when there's more water. But soil moisture is a sad state. Okay, the difference between precipitation and evaporation, there are very few dots here. If you can see the dots in the back, I bet you can't. The dots uh, where, the, where they agree in sign, okay, whether it's getting wetter or drier, and then obviously when we get to sea runoff, uh, which is what the, what the moisture cannot hold. So precipitation is the excess water the atmosphere cannot hold, and runoff is the excess um, water the ground cannot hold. So we have observations of the excesses in the atmosphere and the excesses in the land, in the, in the, from the land, but we don't have clues to the processes. So in the climate model, now I will cite only the NCAR climate model, the hydrology is done in such a fashion, and this is following Dickinson from a long time ago, uh, you have precipitation, evaporation, transpiration, this interception somewhere, interception here through flow, etc. But when you go down to the subsurface in the NCAR climate model, there's, the, the, there's three, there are many layers, uh, but it's 3.8 meters. And at 3.8 meters, we have a concrete floor. Okay, no water goes below. And the, and the, and the percolation, very slow infiltration, modeled by the Richards equation, governed by, by the hydraulic conductivity. So what we've learned from the measurements is that there are other processes not captured by the model. Here is a hydraulic redistribution in the, in the Amazon. Here is the, uh, so you, there are these probes you stick into the, into the tree, into the root, and with a heat power, so by the direction and the speed, the temperature change, you can, you can figure out the velocity. So if we start with, a day, with nighttime, then you can see here the sap flow is towards the tree, and this is away from the tree. So this is towards, this is lateral roots, lateral roots here, and tap roots. 
If we keep going in the day, obviously all the water is t towards the tree. The the the, t the tap roots. There's water from below, and then the nutrients are near the surface, so all the water is towards the tree. Uh, after a rain, however, you can see the tap roots put water down. Okay, so into to depth, even though the, uh, while the while the the lateral roots pull water towards the tree up, I call this offshore banking. Okay, so the trees have some IQ that would put water away and hide it from the atmosphere. Okay, so that would supply the trees in the dry season. And so this is direct measurement, and we can, and we have already put this. So this is a, a, a cartoon of it that Todd Dawson has done. That 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 there's a very fast process through the roots of the, the through the tap roots, and that's a fast process for for redistribution of water uh, in the subsurface. So what I did was. Um, I think in, an er in a moment of either arrogance or stupidity or senility, I told my friends they're not measuring the right things and I'm going to do it myself. So I wrote a proposal to study the life cycle of water and we argued that present measurements uh, are, are not, uh, not frequent, not at the frequency not high enough frequency to, to observe the processes. So I wrote that it is like listening to a Beethoven symphony one note every minute. So we need a high frequency, we need new measurements. So the University of California in the Natural Reserve System has about 48 research sites and we, and we went to the northern one elder, uh, from Mendocino, California and we went there uh, and instrumented a very small watershed. So this is totally uh, lock gates and everything. And the reason for choosing that site is it is the first rain from the Pacific Ocean before the mountains, and it is very steep. You can see here the research site is 35 degree angle. So in terms of a PhD thesis, so I, can see, I can track the water, the rain, and that goes out at the bottom. So, the very steep side, here's the river, uh, and here is the upslope, you can see the control lines. So about in, a, in an area about 4,000 square meters, we put in uh, 10 over 1,000, now we've gone much bigger, uh, sensors. So uh, soil moisture, uh, sap flow, etc., etc. So we drilled about 15 wells to a water table about 20 meters deep. Uh, and we have all sorts of, and so everything is reporting. We put in Wi-Fi towers in the research site and solar panels and everything. Okay, so all the data are beaming home at 15 minute, uh, fif higher than 15 minute frequency data. But, but so at lower order, we have 30 minute data and they're all beaming home to campus um, in real time. So I'm going to start by talking about the trees. So here I have, we, we reverse the, the river is now at the bottom and the road, and so this is going uphill. So we put in, uh, these are all evergreen trees, um, Douglas fir, Bay, uh, Madrone, Tanok, these are all evergreen trees, and, and there's this very small area so the trees can touch one another. And so we put in, in 25 trees, we put in 30, 53 sensors, so these are sap flow sensors, again, the heat pulse measurement. And so 30 minute frequency and we have more than, well now longer than three years of data. So <laughs> the first result that came in was very exciting. So we have a wet season and the dry season. So, so here is this, the sap flow. There is a little bit of flow, but as soon as it rained, then the sap flow went up. So the trees immediately, it was thirsty tree, immediately uh, there was uh, water uh, to supply photosynthesis. When we look at the, all the other trees, and I'm just showing you an example of the other trees, then for the duck fir, which I just showed you, this is a tall tree, and the students named it Eileen because it is a leaning tree. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can see here that the, as soon as the rains came, in the wet season, the, the, the sap flow went up, and you can see, in the, and then it maintained high, high sap flow through the wet season, and then in the dry season, 
it came slowly ramped down the sap flow. So basically we're thinking about this as transpiration, photosynthesis and transpiration that's very sensitive to the rain. When we look at the madrones, however, this is a surprise. The madrones have the maximum sap flow, or we interpret maximum transpiration, in at the height of the dry season when the soils are dry. Okay, so we don't know what's going on. And the, and the, and the live oak is a slow ramp up, uh, and then when it's drying, it's a slow ramp down. So I'm just showing you three trees, but we've done, so this is, uh, we've done all, you know, we have 25 trees, and this is now longer than three years, now maybe five years of data that we've got. So this is a repeatable pattern for all the trees. So for, with the data, so you can easily see, this is the vapor pressure deficit, so this is one minus relative humidity, if you will, temperature sensitive. And so this is a demand for moisture, and here is a sap flow. So you can see for the duck flow, what I just showed you, that the it maximum sap flow when the soil moisture is high, whereas the madrone is the opposite. It's not as high sap flow, but it's maximum when the soils are dry. So one could do, when what we have done is to take all the data and do Monte Carlo, and so we can fit it to a particular, the transpiration or sap flow, and, and obtain these coefficients, which, were, which are now species dependent. Okay, this is a crucial thing. Is that we have species dependent who comes in later, you know, more, more sen sensitive, to more tolerant of soil, dry soils, and or responding faster to light. So we're taking this, the species differences, and in and we do have the FIA, the forest inventory analysis. So we have for every kilometer. Uh, of land, we have an absolute count of the number of sp each species, the number of trees, the number of madrones, number of oaks, of diameter, of, of multiple diameter, so we can scale this up to do the whole landscape. Okay, so this is, we have done the calculation, and I don't need to tell you that if I have a fully if I have a landscape of summer transpiring madrones, it is about one Kelvin cooler than if I have a duck fir that do not landscape, that, do, that no transpiration in the summer. So this is California. So, but the question is, it, the question is how, how do I, where do they get water from? We drilled 15 wells, and this is the first, first data, and this is the shock. So again, now the river is here and upslope. This well up slope, had, with the water table is 15 meters below the surface. And after the first storm, it rose, the water table came up by one meter. One meter, it just went up. We had long discussions about whether this is old water, new water, but now the chemical analysis shows very clearly that that the precipitation has no ma low magnesium, and you can see the dilution of the water when, when all of that came in. So again, we have now multiple years of data for this. And so, so what is happening uh, with, with this particular site? And this is 20 meters. So Daniela Rempe, another student, uh, took a, a neutron probe, okay, that you measure water for, that's fla fla it's been flown to Mars to detect water. So you have a neutron probe and you lower, and it senses the hydrogen. So you can lower it, it senses around one foot. So you lower it by, okay, foot by foot into the well, into the well airspace. And so here is the departure, it's a moisture, in, in a sense, think about it as a moisture meter, and it's departure at the beginning of the wet season. So you can see the penetration, this, this is different wells, uh, I'm just showing six wells. You can see the water table coming up uh, here, etc. But the point I want to make is that this water, there's a change in the water content all the way down to 12 meters here, 18 meters, etc. Okay, so, so the picture we have is that you have fractures in the, in the, in the rock. Here's the fresh bedrock, here's the weather bedrock, and normally what the climate models do in the typical soil moisture is just the upper upper deck or there's a soil layer. So we have some saprolite here, rotten, rotten rocks, and weathered bedrock. And so when we have first storms, 
then, there, then it, the storms would go down fractures, uh, and then you can see the, the water table coming up, um, etc. So when we do the inventory, then it's 30% of the water table, uh, water, the water, the integral of the water is in the weathered bedrock. That's not in the water table that you can measure, nor in the upper soil layer. So here I have a, 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 a source of water for the trees. And so now, I'm, again, I'm thinking about the climate model. So we now have a new parameterization, also using the same equations, but we have a hydraulic conductivity, where the difference is that the variance, it's a stochastic representation, but the variance changes with the soil moisture. So I have some measure, some, some estimate of the fracture density. The sigma is a measure of how, how many secret passageways I have underfoot. Okay, and then the variance, if, it, if the soil is saturated, all the, all, the, all the passageways are filled, so there's not much variance, whereas when it is dry, there's a, you know, the water can go this way or that way. So I'll just show this. So here's the, the up, this is the rain. So you can see the water coming down. Here's the water table. And so it has worked, it, it has worked fairly well uh, with the, uh, with the rain coming, and because the, there's less porosity, you get saturated, the, 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 the weather bedrock is saturated, and this is how we're really pleased that when the, it came up. So this is the, the down, you should not be impressed with the down, we manually remove the water to pretend there's, there's lateral flow. I won't show the whole movie, but I can, uh, but you get the idea that we, we're doing a new stochastic um, representation. You can see here, this is the hydraulic conductivity. It's these, these, <coughs> these outliers, these guys that would allow the water to penetrate down. So to summarize, what I'm proposing here is that in the climate models so far, we have slow processes. And I think back to ocean, to ocean modeling, that once upon a time we had only mixed layer models, okay? And then we figured out uh, fast processes, and now we have hydraulic redistribution by the root system, and we have fracture flow. And so this obviously will alter the, soil, the, the, the upper, the bottom boundary condition for the atmosphere, the, not just soil moisture, and enough has been said about soil moisture and temperature, that it also could permit evapotranspiration of some trees through dry seasons and droughts. When, I, when my friends who do field work show me data, I used to say, do I have to worry about you? Now I ask myself, do I have to worry about me? Um, so the next steps we have is to figure out the represent, you know, so we have done this, this works for every, all the wells at our site, and we are now going across the US and trying to see, you know, the representativeness of this. Thank you. And these are the students. These are the students and other people, Todd Dawson and Daniela, climbing trees. So they really love it. Huh? They look really great. And I'm, I'm a theoretician. I'm afraid of heights, so you seldom see me there. <laughs> yeah. Time for a couple of questions. Jerry. I'm wondering how heterogeneous this is uh, horizontally. Uh, how difficult it would be to deal with that. This is really this nice. Is a, this, I, I refer to Piers and to Paul and, and to Randy. This is a big question. The heterogeneity of the land surface is a big question. So this is where the, 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 the end game, at least for our site, is to see if we could, we could get through to the, soil, to the stream flow, to see how the simplification we need to do. So the way I'm thinking about it is the first step is to, is to try to model to every detail. And then once I've got that, then I can figure out what I can throw out and what I can simplify. But at the moment, I don't know. Would it be possible to average horizontally? I wonder. Well, I'm referring to the experts back there who have written papers on the heterogeneity of the soil, of soil moisture in, yeah, in the land surface. Uh, Paul says you answered his question. So we don't need Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank